is part four of the power of principle. Next week will be part five, and then we will move into a new series. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about prayer. So if you have been here for the last 18 months, I'm going to try this again. I'm going to try this again. But this is the most important part, I'm going to suggest, that this is the most important part of your relationship with God. If you get this, your life will change. 365 days from now, if you pray for 30 minutes every day, if you pray for 30 30 minutes every day, 365 days from now, your life will not be the same. I guarantee you. I was talking to the leadership team earlier, and I was like, what if your life really did look just like the one that Jesus lived And we weren't just talking about it. Like, what if you really thought like Jesus thought? What if you really did what Jesus did? What if you really laid hands on the sick and people recovered? What if you really told people about Jesus everywhere that you went? What if you really had the same power that Peter did whenever he was walking down the road and people were being healed by just his shadow because the weight of God's glory was so powerful in his life? What if? What if that life was really possible, and it is, but the number one thing that your generation lacks is the topic that we are communicating on tonight. Jesus prayed in the secret place, and he took command in the open space. Matthew 6, 6 says this, but when you pray, go into your room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When Moses was on the, on the bank of the Red Sea, they, the Israelites looked at the sea, and it was high, so they couldn't walk through it. They would drown. So it was real simple. The, the Israelites, who God had brought out of Egypt, which is a representation of you guys, so Egypt's like the world. So God was trying to pull his people out of the world. God's trying to pull you out of the world, out of the systems and the devices and the, and the way that the world thinks. He wants to take your mind out, and he wants to give you a new mind. He was trying to get them out. And Moses looked at the the sea, and he got frustrated with God because he was like, we're getting pursued by the Egyptians, and they had, like, powerful weapons, and the Israelites were slaves whenever they left Egypt. So they had nothing. They didn't have a sword. They didn't have a gun. They didn't have a bow and arrow. They didn't have a rock. They didn't have a stick. They didn't have anything. They didn't have, any, any, they didn't have anything to fight with. So the Egyptians are closing down on them. The Egyptians were like people of war. Like they had, they had war things. They had like chariots and horses and, and bows and arrows and machetes and machine guns, the whole bit. So the, the Israelites, God's people, are freaking out. And Moses starts freaking out because he was like, God, I brought them out of Egypt, we got into the desert. They're, they're like complaining about me. They're complaining at me because they didn't have food and then they didn't have water. All these different things. So Moses is taking all these complaints. And it's interesting because Moses, out of the entire group of, of humans that got let out, was the man of prayer. He was the man that went to the top of the mountain and prayed while the people sinned. Are you guys tracking with me? And God got mad at him. He's praying, and God is getting angry at him. And God's like, Moses, why are you being a crybaby? I'm telling you what the Word of God says right now. He says, Moses, why are you being a crybaby? He didn't call him a crybaby. He said, why are you crying? Why are you being a crybaby? Stand up, look at the sea, and command it to split. And Moses is like, oh. I just didn't think about that. I didn't think to speak to the sea to split so we could walk across on dry ground. Because it's this, it's this. When you pray in the secret place, God will reward you in the open space. Faith moves you to a place of authority. We talked three weeks ago on the ability to speak God's word and, to, and, and that being your place of authority and knowing that whatever you speak is going to come to pass. But if you are not a person of prayer, your words do not become as powerful Because Moses was the man of prayer, he was the one that God gave the authority to, to speak to the sea, to split. His prayer built his faith, 
and to a place of authority. Are you guys tracking with me? Is everybody tracking with me? So if you don't pray, your words are less powerful. If you don't pray, your words are less powerful. If you are not alone with God in the secret place, there is no open reward. If you are weak in prayer, you will be weak in life. If Jesus got to the cross because he prayed in the garden, if his ultimate, his, his, his ultimate destination, his ultimate destiny was fulfilled in the garden on his knees when he prayed, if he needed the garden to get to his destiny, how are you going to buck the system? How are you going to get to your destiny if you are not a man or a woman of prayer? You will have to do it a way that is different than the Word of God. And if you're going to do Bible things, you have to do them Bible ways. If you are going to do Bible things, you have to do them Bible ways. Prayer is proven power all over the Word of God. Mark 9.23 says this, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes, and the purpose of prayer is to build your faith because faith eventually will turn into authority. I was talking about uh, during COVID, I was on a Zoom call with Pastor Bill, and we were talking about faith and authority, and he said this, faith is the avenue, authority is the destination. So what's in between? Prayer. See, we, we use this terminology sometimes, and we're like, well, we, we pray and we fast to move God. God doesn't move. He's everywhere. He's not moving. We can't move him. He is here. He's in me. He's in you. He is, he is omnipresent. He is literally everywhere. Whenever we pray, this is what happens. The God on the inside of you begins to move through you. God use, uses natural laws to teach spiritual laws. Let me, let me try to re-explain. Let me try to re-explain. I need to think of an analogy that's not in my notes right now. There is, a, there is a sea that's called the Dead Sea. Everything that goes into the Dead Sea dies because there's no outlet in the Dead Sea. So the water gets stagnant. I don't know how. I'm not really like a, I have a brother who's like a bio, biology, chemistry, major. Like I, need a, I need a science person right now and a smart one. But there was no outlet, so whenever the water would come in, it would go stagnant, and nothing can live inside of the Dead Sea. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. There's no outlet. When we con Prayer connects us with God. Fasting disconnects you from the world. Prayer connects you with God. When we connect with God and prayer gets in you, it moves God in you, through you. It does something in you, and then it moves out of you. If the God that's on the inside of you, call it the Word, call it God, call it Jesus, Call it whatever you want to because those are all the same thing, right? If the word that's on the inside of you, if the God that's on the inside of you, if the Jesus that's on the, on the inside of you never comes out of you, it will become stagnant and then we get religiosity. We, get a, we, get a dead, we have so many dead preachers preaching to, to, to dead people's spirits, dead sermons, to dead humans, and there's no life. What does prayer do? Prayer comes and takes, it works God in us and through us, and it gets him out of us. His very expression in us and through us and out of us, which is what builds our faith. Every time one of your prayers are answered, your faith does what? It builds. Every time you pray and a prayer is answered, it builds your faith. Small things to big things, small things to big things. You cannot buck the system. Much prayer, much blessing. It's the spiritual law of sowing and reaping. It's no different than your finances. It's no different than ministry. People want to do big ministry. If you're going to do big ministry, you've got to be big in, in ministry. If you can't minister to the person in Walmart at the, in the grocery section, tough to do big time ministry. We have people trying to do it. Dead sermons to dead people produce Death. I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about believers. Are you guys tracking with how important is prayer? How important is prayer? Because prayer ignites something on the inside of you. The disciples, after, after Jesus had uh, ascended, they were, they were walking along, and Jesus was, come, Jesus was behind them. And, and 
and Luke, and they didn't know it. They, he, was, he was walking next to him, but they didn't recognize him. And they were talking, and they were like, oh, how, how my heart burned whenever I sat with Jesus, and he opened up the scriptures to us. Understand this. You will never have to advertise a fire. The, uh, the building's on fire. <laughs> it's like, duh. I, I get it. <laughs> like, the, the, right? There's fire everywhere. If you were on fire for God, you don't have to walk around and say, I'm a woman, woman of God or man of God. Like, you don't have to say it. Prayer ignites fire on the inside of you. And what does fire do? It's all consuming. It consumes up everything around it. It's contagious. It gets on people. It will burn an entire city to the ground. And the, the, the flicker that's on the inside of you is ignited through prayer. This is the only way that I can explain it. If you want to be on fire for God, do you know that Jesus talked about a baptism of water and of fire, fire, fire? Why fire? Because it burns up the things that aren't supposed to be there, and it continues to burn. It's, it consumes. God is an all-consuming fire. Without prayer, there is no fire. You can, go to church, you can go to church every Sunday. You can take part in the program. You can come to the 530 meeting. You can do it all. You can go to the Sub 30 Connect group. If you're not in a Sub 30 Connect group, my wife is doing one tomorrow night. It'll be awesome. There'll be food. Big house. You can go. You can have fun. You can talk about girl things and how you haven't, how you haven't met your husband. But you can never become a woman of God without the fire of God. And you will not ever have the fire of God without praying like God. If prayer has a secondary place in your life, God will never have the first place in your life. It is so much, prayer is so much about experiencing God, about an experience with God. Not, I, 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 we can tell people about God. We can tell people about Jesus. We can even share the love of Jesus with people. We can give them food and water whenever they're hungry. We can pray for them. We can invite them into our home. We can give them a conversation whenever they're, they're lonely. We can do all of these things, but nothing can replace an experience with God. Whenever you truly experience God in the quiet place, and if your experience with God has cost you nothing, honestly, it's not worth anything. If it's cost you something, it's worth something. If it's cost you everything, it's worth everything to you. You have no problem or issue getting up early and getting into your prayer closet. Whenever I ran to an altar in front of 4,000 people, it, 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 didn't, it, it felt like it cost me It felt like it cost me everything. I know it, it probably at that moment, now that I'm older, I'm like, Bailey, you're a little bit older, right? Like you can track with me a little bit. Like you're like at least in your mid-20s. I'm like heading towards my mid-40s. But I ran to an altar in front of 4,000 people and I was sitting next to some, some dudes that were getting ready to be professional athletes and girls that were probably pretty and, and popular, and we were talking about whatever we had done on the weekend that Friday and Saturday, which was a Friday and Saturday that I had almost lost my life because drinking and driving was a hobby and something that I did for fun back in the day. But whenever I left my seat and I ran to that altar in front of all of my, what I, I, I think were pretty popular, studly peers at the time, I lost something. Like there was a level of humiliation whenever I was running. I just, I wish that it was one of those where you could like raise your hand. It would have been so much more convenient in the moment. But he said, you have to run. Um, and I ran and I never quit running. And I lost relationships and I lost friendships. And I lost the time that I typically went to bed, which was 4 or 5 a.m. on a Monday or Tuesday night because I was up taking part in extracurricular activity. I changed all those things immediately. And I began to get up and go down to the chapel at 5 and 6 a.m whenever I was 22 years old, and spend two or three hours with God. And I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was praying. But I stuck, and I stayed, and I stayed with God. And I had a couple of friends that took me down there, and they would pray for two hours, and I would pray for 10 minutes. But I continued to stay down there with them for two hours until God. I went from a place of I was saying pr prayers to a place that I really began to pray, and that's very different because I grew up in a very religious church where they would say prayers. They named the prayers, and we would say the prayers. And I went to a place of just saying prayers to praying. I can't explain it unless you've been there, unless you've said a few religious prayers, until you've gone to a place where you've said a prayer to a place of praying, to a place where you connect with the heart of God, that you know that you're in the presence of God, hearing from God. 
understand this. This is how much you'll do for God. Exactly how much of God that is on the inside of you. You can't do more than that. That's how important the word of God is. But God's ability to get his word in you and through you all has to do with prayer. It is the X factor. It's why the disciples could not find Jesus in the morning because he was off on the side of the mountain alone with his father prepping and preparing and getting ready to do God's work. An experience with God that costs you nothing is not worth anything. The law, the, the prayer has to do with the law of prayer, and this is point number one. That was the intro. I've got two minutes and 45 seconds left. I hate that clock. The law of prayer, and you guys understand that, that like there's universal laws, like, like we saw, we, we, we sow, we reap, right? The law of gravity, if it goes up, it's got to come down. And then there's laws that supersede those things. The law of prayer is no different. It, much prayer, much blessing. It's just, it is what it is. It's not, I was sitting down in the chapel whenever I was 22 years old, I didn't know how to pray, but God honored my commitment to pray. So now if I had to go pray for five hours right now, it would seem like five minutes. It would seem like five minutes. God honored the commitment. It's not, it's not that you know how to pray. God will de develop your, your prayer life if you will commit to pray. He will develop your prayer life if you will commit to pray. If you pray to God for him to help you to learn to pray, he will teach you how to pray as you don't know as you are. This is what the word of God says. And the level that you pray is the level that you will reap. And the level that you don't pray, if I plant 100 apricot seeds or apricot seeds into the ground, a lot of them are going to grow. Some of them aren't. But if I plant one, I know there's only a chance that one could grow. This is the law of prayer. The more you pray, the more God can do in you and the more he can do through you. The more you pray, the more authority that he can give you. God is not putting spiritual infants on the front lines of his army. God is looking for people that he can place his delegated authority into. Delegated authority. I have a couple hundred employees. I've got assistant coaches. Some have delegated authority. One takes a little bit more authority than what I give him, but I I trust him. But if he comes into my office and he's like, hey, I really like this player. We need to make him an offer. Show. Like my, I, my ears perk. Because he has a lot of delegated authority. He has a lot of trust. We have been together for a while. I trust, I've seen the results of his work. So I trust him. So I have given him the authority to operate and function in some finances and some money things and some decisions inside of my program. Are you guys tracking with me? I have delegated a certain amount of authority. There are recruits sometimes that we recruit that he does all the talking to on the way in because I know that he's going to ask the right questions, he's going to vet the process, and I know on the back end that I'm going to get a high, high, high character kid that's hopefully good at soccer, and then if they're not, I'm going to yell at him. Everybody tracking with me. Delegated authority. This is what God is looking at from you. How does God know that he can trust you? How is trust built? Time spent equals relationship. You'll never know God more than the amount of time you spend with him. How is trust built? There are certain ones of you, most of you, that I am not trusting with your kids. I have spent more time with Bailey Thompson. Bailey took all four of my kids. Did you take all four of them to the park? Three. Why did you do that? And they, they were, my kids were mean to her. Like, they called her house small, and they were like, this is the smallest house. And I was like, oh, my God, I, I grew up poor, but now my kids are snobs. Like, I don't know where I went wrong. Primo's like, oh, we'll fix it. We'll fix it. I've got a big paddle. We'll fix it. But I like, I'm not leaving my kid. I'm, I, I love Nico. I've spent a little bit of time with him. Like, I'm not, I'm not sending my, I'm not trusting Nico with my kids. Like, I've known him for like six months, six to eight months. I've known Bailey for years. I've known her, her fiance for years. I've known her, her husband. You guys are married, all right? And I've known him for years. And there's no chance that I would have given him the kids without her. What can God trust you with? How much time have you spent with God, and how much can he trust you with? How much of his burden can he trust you with? How much of your burden can he trust me with? How much time do I spend praying for you and your generation? 
how much time did I spend on this message this week? You think I th- do you think I threw it, threw it together this morning? How much time did I spend communicating with the Holy Spirit about what you needed to hear that would penetrate your heart and cut you and change you and convict you? Because a sermon that doesn't penetrate, that doesn't cut, that doesn't convict, I, I did, I, I make CrossFit jokes. I did do CrossFit for a while. If you do CrossFit for a while, you do a lot of pull-ups. Right, Brody? You're at least an athlete. You don't, you don't do CrossFit because they don't allow that, right? But whenever you do pull-ups, you get calluses right here on your hand. You've gotten them. Like, you're big and buff and, like, awesome, which is why Kate wants to spend the rest of her life with you. So, like, over time, those calluses get so big that, like, you could take a butter knife and you could cut through those calluses and there would be no blood, right? You would just cut through the calluses and it's just more what? It's just more skin. You don't feel anything. This is like a sermon that's not birthed in prayer with no thought, with no talking to the Holy Spirit, nothing that's going to cut you, nothing that's going to convict you, nothing that's going to change you, nothing that's going to get you to bed earlier so you can get up earlier, so you can get to the throne room of grace, so you can spend more time with God, nothing that's going to cut you, nothing that's going to change your words, your, your friendships, your relationships, the way that you spend your time, what you're watching on Netflix, or the fact that you may just not watch it. Some of you are not watching it anymore. You're doing other things with your evening time. You're watching sermons. You're spending time with God. You're reading books. You're putting eternal things in your life so you can do eternal things with your life. If the sermon doesn't do this, the sermon's useless. If it doesn't cut you, if it doesn't convict you, it doesn't, conviction just means to, it doesn't mean to condemn you. Conviction means to expose and to change. If you cut me with a sharp knife and I begin to bleed, what am I going to do? I'm going to change where my hand's at. Yes or no? I'm going to pull it away. Prayer is but faith, resting in, acting with, and leaning on, and obeying God. Jesus cleansed the temple. In verse 12, it says this, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers. Matthew 21. I did not have that in my notes. Matthew 21, 12. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of, of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. In the Old Testament, the temple and the tabernacle was not just a picture of your salvation. It was the place that housed God. Are you guys tracking with me? So whenever they finished the temple and the tabernacle, God's glory would come down into the temple and the tabernacle, and that's where God would live. In the New Testament, God said, you are the modern-day temple. You are the modern-day tabernacle. You are now the physical house that houses God. Jesus came, (coughs) Uh, it's probably that coronavirus popping up on me again. (laughs) Jesus came to cleanse the temple. Think about this, because the depth of this is incredible. You are now the modern day temple. There was things going on in the temple and the tabernacle that Jesus did not appreciate. It had turned into a place where they were just doing trade. Most humans are only concerned with their vocation and doing trade. The very thing that God said he would add unto them if they would seek the the kingdom of God first, yes? Are you guys tracking with me? So Jesus comes into the temple, and he begins to drive out the money changer and the people that are changing hands and changing the money and doing trade inside of the temple, and he said, don't you know that you, as the temple and the tabernacle of God, are called to be a house of prayer? And in the temple and in the tabernacle and the Old Testament, the very thing that's set between the holy place and the holy of holies, the holy of holies, the place that only the high priest could get into was the altar of incense, which was always burning with fire, which represented prayer without ceasing. The very thing that separated the high priest from every other person in the camp was prayer, because prayer is the greatest separator between mere men and men and women 
of God. It is the greatest separator. It is the X factor. It is the thing that will produce more power in your life than any other thing. There are people who had one chapter of the Word of God and changed an entire country with their prayer life. These are true stories. There was a guy who had Romans chapter 3 and revived an entire country. Millions came to the Lord, and he never had more than Romans chapter 3. Him and his prayer, how important is your prayer life? And it's crazy because verse 14 says, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. The miracles began in the temple. The miracles began in the temple. You're the temple. Are you tracking with me, Maddie? You're the temple. The miracles began in the temple whenever everything else got driven out, and it became a place of prayer. Exactly what it was intended to be. Paul said, I pray without ceasing. I do not stop praying. I do not stop praying. I do not stop praying. And he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And he said, I've prayed in tongues more than all my other brethren. I've outprayed every man alive. I've outdone every man alive. And then he said, I'm speaking like a fool because it was the grace of God, God's empowerment on the inside of me. But just so you know, I outprayed every man alive and then I went and outdid every man alive. I have outdone every Christian on the planet. And then he was like, I'm talking foolish. I shouldn't be talking like that. I shouldn't be bragging. But he had to say it because he said what? Just so you know how I did it. It was God functioning in me because I outprayed every man alive. The prayer for a powerful, the prayerless or powerless, those who pray obey, it flows really well. No man will transcend his prayer life. Luke 11, 5 through 8 says this. Jesus was teaching on, on prayer, and I want, you to, I want you to catch this, because the, the point number two is the secret of success in the kingdom is tenacious prayer. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go out to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on a journey. And I have nothing to set before him, and he will answer from within and say, please do not trouble me. The door is shut now, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, he won't rise and give to him because he is simply his friend. Yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as much as he needs. This Greek word for persistence is brazen tenacity, which changes the scripture so much, so much, so much. And the Palestinian time, Palestinian culture, the houses, it was a poor culture, but the houses were all next to each other. And they weren't brick and mortar like you understand. They weren't built of things where you couldn't hear through. And they were very close to each other. So it was very culturally insensitive for travelers to come along and to ask for bread or food or for a night stay for their journey and for people not to allow them in. Like, if you didn't allow them in, it would be like you standing at the door and it was raining and cold and there was a girl outside and you just kept the door shut if you were a dude. Like, this is the only way that I can explain it. It's like, open the door and you're locking them outside. Ladies, are you guys tracking with me? You're like, what a, what a jerk. Like, worst, worst dude ever. Like, we would never date that kind of guy. This is how culturally insensitive it was in this culture, to not take care of people that are traveling. Jesus is showing and teaching a parable about prayer, about brazen tenacity, about tenacious prayer. Because the very thing that stands between you and your greatest capacity is the tenacity to pray. Not just to pray, but the tenacity in which you pray. I'm a coach. We do things, right, Brody? We do things certain ways. There's like a tenacious way, and then there's like a way to go through the motions, right? There's a way to say prayers. There's a way to say a prayer, and there is a way to pray. There is another level with you and your relationship with God where you get to the throne room of grace, and you pull things, you pull things out of yourself because God is incredible. 
Jesus walked the earth and he gave us the expression of God and he healed the sick every time and he did miracles and he did signs and wonders. And you have that same God-like character and God-like nature on the inside of you. But your tenacity to pray, Jesus, that the most tenacious prayer we have ever seen in the word of God was whenever Jesus went in the garden and he prayed so hard that he wept blood. Is that tenacious or is that tenacious? Is that tenacious or is that tenacious? That's not just normal prayer. He prayed till he wept blood. He wept the blood in the garden. He shed the blood on the cross. But the tenacity of the prayer changed the world. The tenacity of your prayer will change the environment of your life. It will take what you, what you read Jesus did in the word of God, it will rise up your faith, and it will make you believe and think like God so that you believe and think that you can do the same things that Jesus did whenever he walked the earth. This is why people preach it and don't execute it. This is why we talk about it from the pulpit, and you're like, yeah, but that's not me. I'm just trying to get over my fear and anxiety. I get it. I get it. I'm just trying to find a husband. I get it. I get it. But you don't have to think like that. You can grow into the person. You can grow into the person that God is calling you to be and believe that everything that Jesus did while he walked the earth that you can do without focusing on finding your significant other, your husband, or dealing with the things that you believe that you have to deal with. It's just another focus. And then all of a sudden, the things that you're dealing with all of a sudden are falling off because you're beginning to believe and think that everything Jesus had, you had. You have the ability to do everything that Jesus did. But where you are at right now and your greatest capacity and the thing that stands between is praying with tenacity, not just saying a prayer. Buying into the fact that Paul was the greatest preacher to ever live. And it was not vocational for him. It was a passion. He never exchanged dollars for the word of God, ever. I've never exchanged dollars for the word of God. Nobody has ever paid me to do this. And I wouldn't allow somebody to. There was a man named John Hyde that went into a foreign country. He was a man of 4 a.m. prayer. When they took him to his grave, they went into his room to clean it out. All they could find was a Bible. And next to his bed, there was two wooden grooves, two wooden grooves where he would kneel down and pray. I don't know how long you have to pray on a wood floor to put grooves in the floor, but he went into an Indian country where he didn't speak the language and over a million people gave their lives to the Lord and miracles and signs and wonders followed his ministry. Just him and his prayer life, he didn't even speak the language. How powerful do you think that prayer can make you? You can grasp eternity with prayer. You can touch heaven. You can bring heaven right into your world, bring it in you, through you, and get it on all the people around you. If you believe, if you believe. But the level of your prayer life is determined by you. You're only as spiritual as you want to be. You will have to make the decision. Prayer is a commodity of time but it will make you more powerful than anything else. God, I thank you for this night. I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that it lands on good ground. God, that you give us a revelation of prayer, that you give us a revelation of touching eternity, Father God. You give us a revelation of bringing down heaven. You didn't send your son, Jesus, Father God, to die on a cross to send us to heaven, which is why we're here. You sent your son, Jesus, to die on a cross, God, that we would bring heaven here, Father God, and spread the very culture of your kingdom, the culture of heaven, Father. I thank you, God, that you cannot, they cannot keep us shut up, Father God, that the rocks won't cry out on our behalf, Father, that we will speak of the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, Father. Give us a revelation of prayer. Give us a revelation of the relationship, God, that you want to have with us, Father. God, touch this night. Bless us, Father God. We thank you for your miracle-working power. In Jesus' name, amen.